Uh, tonight, I wanted to uh, go through the New Testament with you. So y'all got a while? All right. Um, there's, a, there's a little thing I like to do every once in a while, and I, I, I try to, uh, sometimes we do these things uh, at the beginning of a, a new year or a new challenge. Uh, sometimes people uh, will want to read through the Bible starting the new year. Uh, sometimes just whenever we get the notion or we get the conviction or challenge the se- ourselves, don't matter what time of year it is, uh, to read through the Bible or get ourselves better acquainted with the Scriptures. And there's not a whole lot of times, though we, we flip through quite a bit of Scripture on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night, but when's the last time you totally looked at the whole New Testament? That's probably been a while, at one sitting. So here's the way I like to do it. I like to get a common reference, and I get a common reference, and it's one that you can find throughout most of the books of the New Testament. And you can go through and you can hit that one reference through the books and you can put yourself in an area in each book where you can glean a lot of information about the New Testament. And it's, of course, it's not an a, a in-depth Bible study. It's not one of those where uh, you're going to be able to have a, 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 a timeline or a, a main outline of the Scriptures. But what this does, and this, uh, the idea of this, is to put you in a spot in the Scripture that is common, that you don't have to sit there and say, well, where am I going to go and read? What passage am I going to turn to today? You know, maybe I don't want to read uh, the whole book at one time. I want to jump around a little bit. Well, to do this, one of the ways that I've come up with, there's many different ways you can challenge yourself to do this, or... Um, one of the areas that I just like to do is just to, to get, my, get my interest re-perked about the, the Word. We talk about revival. We talk about this kind of stuff. And, uh, the, you know, we cannot be revived and everything if we're just sitting. If we just, uh, church is the only time we get the Word, and this is the only time we're excited about it. Uh, you know, if we go home and turn on the, the television and watch a show or a movie or a game, You kind of lose all that you just heard, you know. So we need something that keeps our interest sparked in the Word. I think it's very important. And this isn't just some little gimmick or thing to use, but it is a tool that you can get. So here we go. One of the things that, the areas that I like to do to help spur this along is start with something very common. So how many of y'all can tell me, just throw it out there, the most common quoted verse in the New Testament? Philippians 4.13, John 3.16, all right, you got those? You can take those portions of Scripture, or those references rather, and you can plug them in and go through the New Testament and look it up. What I do is I, use, I commonly use John 3.16 because everybody knows that reference. They know it along with the verse. And the verse is very well known, but the reference is also well known. A lot of scripture we know, but not as much scripture do we know the scripture with that reference so common as John 3.16. So you take 3.16, chapter 3, verse 16, And if you turn and you start in Matthew, because Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, so if you want to turn there, we'll go through and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Because it's one thing to talk about it, but I think you'll find it interesting, I hope you will, uh, when we go through this. Now before we start uh, reading and going through God's Word, uh, let's take a moment and uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for what you do for us. I pray, Lord, as we uh, go through your Word, Lord, Lord, that this is just uh, maybe be a a tool people use to spark their interest in your word. Lord, that we would become excited about it. And Lord, not just something we have to do, but Lord, let us uh, find joy in this, find the peace, comfort, and direction in our life that we need, that you have ready for us. And we just need to to be willing to to put forth some effort and get, get it, Lord. So help us as we do this, and we ask this in your name. Amen. So, 
Matthew 3.16. We go here, and we know it's not going to start the same as John 3.16, but we're going to have uh, some other things. It says, but, but when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now we come to that verse, and we get excited, we sit there and we say, well, this is what's happening here. It says, when he had been baptized. So we're talking about Jesus being baptized. Interesting part, we sit here, and when you think about talking with others about the Scripture and things, there's a, there's a lot of questions that come up. And you're going to see just doing this simple little step is going to put us and give us some pretty good, I call them nuggets, scriptural nuggets that we can get the idea out of this passage and be able to have a, a, a pretty good conversation with somebody, be able to share God's word, and it's also going to be something that's common to your ear, like when somebody asks you a question, well, you know, I know, I know John 3.16 is not the answer, but maybe it was in Matthew 3.16 that got me close. So let me, let me explain. So here we have Jesus showing us baptism. Why are we baptized? One great question that people ask when you're talking about salvation or even after salvation, why am I baptized? Well, Jesus did it, right? That's one of the fastest, quickest answers. That was, he, he showed us by example. Well, how, would, how did he show us? Where is that? Well, you can go right here and, and not just say, well, Jesus did it to show us an example. You can put yourself in the scripture, share and show with someone where it is in the Bible. I think a lot of fear that we have sometimes with the scripture is that, well, I, I just don't know where it is. This is, again, this is one of those things you're going to kind of have fun with. And now I know I can go to Matthew 3.16, again, just using that common reference to know that we're going to talk about Jesus being baptized. And you don't have to stick with that one verse. Another thing about studying Scripture is that the verses surrounding it are very important to bring the whole thought together. Uh, there are some passages uh, that uh, the sentence, just one sentence, passes through many different verses. So to get the complete thought, you have to cover uh, sometimes a wide variety, and sometimes you need to take the chapter before and the chapter after to get the full context of what it's saying. So again, I'm not saying that every 316 verse is all you need. I'm just saying this is something that will get you maybe in a new spot or a new part in the Bible that will spark your, spark your, I keep on wanting to say spark, I don't know why, spark your interest in learning and then familiarizing yourself with the scripture. So again, we're talking about, you want to talk about baptism, and it talks about this is when Jesus came from Galilee, and he came to John. Who is it? John the Baptist? Well, we're talking about John the Baptist. Well, if, if you just read a little bit ahead of 316, you'll see John the Baptist. Uh, he says, in those days, he came preaching in the wilderness, and he it's, it explains who John the Baptist is, and it can it really can help you kind of start making a path. Well, I know John the Baptist, and I know there was a story, there was something about John the Baptist and Jesus when, when they were both infants in the womb. And so you just keep on going back. You go forward, and you can see this is where Jesus, after he's baptized, he starts his ministry. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, and I'm not trying to throw a guilt trip on anybody, but when we're not in the Word as much as we should, and sometimes when people ask us, we're scared to answer, all it is is that we're not familiar with it. That's it. If we're familiar with it and kind of have an idea where it's at, then guys, we'll talk about this more readily. You, if you learn something new, and you kids, you probably know this, if you learn something new, maybe something new in school, and Maybe it's one of those rare moments that you think it's cool and you grab onto it. What do you do? You share that with people, don't you? Hey, I learned this. I got this right. Make good on a test. You share that with everybody, right? You fail it or make one of those bad grades. You don't really do that. But 
Um, see, we, we get information, we want to share it. You guys get good news, you want to tell people about it. This is one of those things. We find out how to make that something that comes alive to us and maybe an area where we can dig in. Let's, let's move on. Th again, this is, you want to find out about baptism and the beginning of Jesus' life? Matthew 3.16 is a great one. But let's turn to the, the next one. Who wants to guess the next chap, uh, the next passage? Mark 360. See, you're catching on. It, it's not that hard. All right. So we'll go to Matthew, uh, Mark 316. And this is talking about this. It, it just starts out like this. Simon to whom, to whom he gave the name Peter. Okay, well, all right. I'm not going to make a life-changing decision off of that verse, am I? Um, I don't know if I'm going to quote that and start a preaching on the corner uh, of the street saying that, but I could, like, we're t like I'm saying, we can take the context and teach something. This is where Jesus, he says, uh, if you go to the beginning of the thought, verse 13, it says, and when he went up on the mountain, he called to him uh, those, uh, those uh, he wanted, it says, he called to him those he himself wanted. Sorry. It says, and they came to him, and he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that my, he might send them out to preach and give power and heal the sickness and cast out demons. And here he gives the list and name of the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles is when they're sent out. Here is when he's sending out those to do the work of God. This is the beginning part of how we're learning how what, what happens when we know Jesus, what happens when we ask forgiveness of our sins, what happens after uh, we have that relationship with Jesus, what are we supposed to do? Well, he's going to call us and send us out. He, he got 12 men that he discipled, 12 men that he taught and, and, and empowered to go out into the, into the area there and be able to perform miracles and do things in the name of Jesus. And we see these names as they're listed here. And learning these names here, as you go through the scriptures, guess what? You're going to see these names again and again and again. And now you're going to be able to know who they are. Well, why did they, why, did, why are they, these 12? Why are these guys? Well, you can see it starts out, it's very simple. Jesus called to those that he himself wanted. He wanted these guys in particular. Men of different areas of the world some men that had wealth, some men that were well-liked and well-known, uh, some men that were well-feared, and not just, uh, it wasn't just uh, going to the seminary and picking out some guys that just graduated or getting ready to. He, he went to uh, the uh, fishing uh, lanes out there and got guys off the boat. He went to the, the lawyer's office and got one. He got tax collectors and got one. Went to the doctor and got a doctor. I mean, there's all these guys that he was wanting to, to have around him. And what we see, apart from Jesus bringing his disciples together, says this is, this is the start of how we see Jesus teaching others to go and do the work. So this is where we get discipleship, discipleship training. This is where we get that call to teach people and not just the pastors to teach it's the pastors and lay people we're all called to go out into this world not necessarily to be preachers and teachers god said that he's given us each uh different uh talents and things and as we can see how jesus has in these passages in this area has been starting to do miracles now he's gathered gathered his men around and now he starts teaching them doctrinal things that will instill their belief in him and be able to teach others the same thing interesting area to look at if y'all never spend much time in the book of mark so let's move on let's go to luke matthew mark luke luke chapter what three verse 16 again it's just to get you in a general area. That way, when you think about these things again, you'll come back to it. And it's kind of an easy tool to use that way. 
again, we go back with John answered saying, I need, uh, uh, I, I needed uh, to baptize you with water, or indeed, I needed, I, I can read, right? I indeed baptized you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Again, this is John teaching the people that he is not as important as the people think he is, but also that he's starting to teach them humility. He says, I baptized Jesus, and this is a story in a story that's being told here, but it's, he sent, John's sitting there telling the people, he says, I'm not even worthy to bend down and tie the guy's shoe. I'm not worthy enough to take that sandal strap and tie it together and put it on. He's talking about, you guys think I'm great, you think because I baptized these people and this man that I'm great. It wasn't like that. See, when Jesus taught these disciples as he taught them to go out and to do the work of the Lord in the community, there was a lot of confusion who had the real power because, again, not all of them, the areas that they were going, were looking uh, at Jesus as being the king of kings. They were still looking for someone uh, of a, a more kingly presence to come in, not someone that was a carpenter's son, uh, you know, walking and not really having uh, a home uh, to, to, to stop and say was his own. Uh, they all, uh, they, they looked at these other men as having, uh, almost putting them on the same level as Jesus. But throughout the scriptures, just like John did, you'll show that these, these men were taught humility. They were taught because it would have been easy to take on that power. Say, I, I do got something. I can heal. I can cast out demons. It would be easy to let that go to your head. But the way Jesus taught them, he taught them that humility, that the glory still, God working through me to them, but the glory still goes back to God. That's an amazing lesson to teach somebody. It's not all about me. Even though God can use me and he can use you, that glory needs to go back to him. That's also a good funnel to, uh, to uh, put, put things through when people are questioning, is this right or wrong? So, does it go back to the Lord, or is it just me? Then we go to John, John 3, 16. Another familiar passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, uh, through him might be saved. Again, this is taking you to a passage that will teach people that God loves the world. He loves the people in the world from the beginning until the end. He's going to love the people here. Now, the choices we make is what makes the difference in our relationship with him. It doesn't mean he doesn't love us no matter what we choose. It means that he loves us regardless. He doesn't, but he cannot accept the sin because if he could accept sin, then he wouldn't have sent his son. See, God sent his one and only he begot his son, his only one and begotten son that would become the perfect sacrifice for us. So you need to be able to find that in here. And then you need to be able to just look at that verse right below it and, and know that God just didn't send his, his son in here to condemn the world. A lot of people, they get confused. They have those questions about God. Well, where do I find the answer when people say that God's a mean God because if God was love, then why would he let all this bad stuff happen to good people, right? Why would babies have to suffer? Why does the, the elder, elderly have to suffer? Why, does, uh, why do we have to work so hard and all this stuff? Well, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn us and to make us feel worse and to, to show us all that that we've done is wrong. He, he came to show us that one, he was the only perfect sacrifice. And two, he lived a life that showed us a need for a savior. That's something the world needs to understand. That God came when he sent his son, Jesus, 
is that his teachings, what he had here on earth, he didn't come here and just shame everybody for their sin, but he made them sure that they were aware of it, but yet he had compassion, that there's a way out. See, that's what God says. He teaches us in his word that we, we, there is temptation. Uh, there's not uh, temptation, but there is, um, there is going to come times uh, when your faith is tried, when you are uh, hurting, when you're stretched to the limit, uh, but God will make a way out. We talked about that Wednesday night. That's one of the things we uh, discussed. But isn't that interesting how you can come to John 3.16 and you can start a conversation through this chapter, through these short verses here that help you understand the love that God has given us through his son on this earth. And again, he wasn't a man. He was a man in a sense, but God sent his son Jesus. So it wasn't just another guy. He wasn't no, just a good man. A lot of people get that wrong. They got it wrong in the olden times. They got it, and they got it, they get it wrong today. Show them in scripture that it's true. This is truth. And the, uh, the Bible says the truth will be the thing that sets us free. If you turn to the book of Acts, I bet y'all can't guess where we're going again. <laughs> 316 again. Again, I'm just trying to show you some of these tools you can use. So Acts 3, 16, it says, In his name, through, the, through faith, uh, in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of, all, uh, of you all. Now, what is happening here? Well, we go to the beginning of chapter 3, and we see Peter and John went up together to the temple. Okay? They went up to the temple, and there was a lame man that was there. And through their, um, through their uh, talking and uh, conversation, uh, verse 6, Peter says, Then, he, then Peter said, uh, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have to give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He we say that, we go here and, and look at that, and remember in 3.16, it says, And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness and, and presence to you all. So when, when Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, like I can't buy you a good doctor, I can't buy your way out, I, I really can't get you a good meal. I don't have two pennies to rub together. How many of y'all ever had to use that statement about your, uh, about your finances? Peter was there. He's like, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't have much to give, but I can tell you this, in the power of the one in whom I believe and the faith that I trust, rise up and walk. And guess what? The man was able to rise up and walk. Not only did he rise up and walk, but he ran and he got people, ran to get them. You know what kind of miracle that is for somebody that has been lamed up, haven't been able to use their legs or anything to be able to get up, stand up is a miracle, but run is another one. He had fully, full restoration. And then all the people came and were greatly amazed and were standing with, with uh, Peter and John and they were starting again to put these men on a pedestal about how good they are. If you get a common thing going on here, a lot of times when somebody did something great through, the, through God working for them, people would always look at the man as someone that was important. But the way that, that they turned this back around, it was the faith that I have in his name, and it's talking about God, and the faith that I, uh, that I am speaking is what made this man strong. It's what has given him perfect soundness, and, in, and it's been done in the presence of all of you. It wasn't me. It was me being that vessel that God can use to do a miracle. It's one of those areas where I think God teaches us 
that yes, he still does miracles. He does miracles today. Um, there's things that we have claimed in the name of God, and we've seen him work. We've seen great things. You've been able to go to the scripture and be able to find that and be like, this is proof that it started. But guess what? E even though God uses me, again, he's getting the glory. It's the, the men that stands up, you, up here. I stand up here. Pastor Billy stands up here. Other pastors, we, we tell you all the time, it's not the pastor you need to worship. It's not that man you need to, to look up to. Now, God has put us in a position that where we should take it very seriously, and I do, and I know Pastor Billy does as well, but it needs to be a place where you see that God is the one had, who led, who, who guides, who gets us going. And this is a big question. Now, for us to go to church all the time, this not, might not be a big thing, but you might need to know where to come in, in the Word and find it. Again, that's the, uh, the reason we're looking at this tonight, give you some familiarity with the Word. Moving on to Romans chapter 3, verse 16. And I know we're covering a lot here. It says, destruction and misery are in their way. Well, what in the world? <laughs> That's a good one to jump to, right? That's going to teach us a lot. But again, instead of just reading that one verse and saying, well, it's not working for me, what am I going to do? It's getting you in, that, in a general area in the, in the scripture to be able to get. So if you go back, let's back up. You can go to verse, uh, verse 9. It says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both uh, Jews and Greeks that they, are all under, uh, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is, there is none who understand. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have, come to, uh, they have uh, together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, and their tongues, uh, they have practiced deceit. Uh, the poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Read it together and understand when we talk about fear, where is it, this is a good place to come to. We have all have sin. We're not perfect. And those of us that claim that we are will in turn will be saying that either they don't believe in God or the judgment of God or what God would, it will do. So God is a God of love, but he's also a just God. That's something we need to remember. And this is a good place to go for that because there's going to be a price to pay for those who think that they are perfect, who think they do not have sin. And again, there's many people out there. You probably talk to them. They might think they did something wrong, but they don't understand that that wrong is a conviction when they feel that, that is a conviction that God has brought on their life that is showing them that they've done something against the will of God in their life. And it is sin. And sin is one of those things that we have to admit to in order to receive Jesus' forgiveness. Do you need forgiveness on something you haven't done? Would you ask forgiveness on something you didn't realize that you did? See, we have to help people understand that there's real sin in this world. And guess what? None of us are perfect. We've all done it. And this is showing that we need to have the, the fear of God, not trembling, not fearful as we're scared to death of him, but an honest, reverent respect for him and knowing that we don't, we don't, there is a, we don't have to approach him with all the sin. We don't have to live with this in our life. There is a way for us to have forgiveness. And we find that through the rest and through the part uh, of, of the book of, of Romans here. And this is just really, in this section, this is, this is really trying to get people, uh, when the Bible says to lay yourself bare before him, the book of Romans will cause you to do that. 
And it's one of those books that people say, well, this is just, this is on another level. I don't know if I can handle that. Well, it's just like an elephant, all right? You ever want to eat an elephant? Y'all remember how to do that, right? One bite at a time. You take little chunks and bites and get there. It's when we sit there and say, well, it's just too much. I'm not even going to try. You miss out. That'd be, I don't know. I'd love to say I did that, tried it, and did it, you know? An elephant. It's a big task, but you can do it. The uh, First Corinthians chapter three sixteen. It says, "But do you not know that you are a temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which you, which and says, which temple are you? Now." Why would, where would this become important? Well, there's a lot of people who have a lot of questions about their body, have a lot of questions about this. What is right and wrong to do with it? Well, if this body, and you can go with the analogy that is here, is that this is a temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in here. So if it's something that you can pass through this temple and knowing that the Spirit of God dwells in you and you're okay with that, that'd be a good litmus test for you. If it's one of those things that passes on you or through you and you could, you'd be embarrassed to stand before God, and I'm not talking about standing in front of the church. I'm not talking about standing in front of the deacon board. I'm not talking about standing in the pastor's office getting grilled on something. I'm talking about standing before God himself, who it's just you and him, and the truth is going to be known. Are you okay with that? It says, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? That's a good question. Which temple are you? And so many people have so many questions. They, they're unsatisfied with themselves. And we seem to think that it's all this stuff that we put on makes us a better person. Well, being satisfied with what God gave you is one thing. And to be able to treat that with respect as a gift of God is another thing. You know, it is, it is a hard, hard thing sometimes to talk to people that have gone through so much in their life that their body is physically hurt. You know people like that? Their body is physically hurt. Uh, it, it's painful them to, for, for them to do things. And some people will say, well, you know, it's, you have to just take it easy, don't do anything, sit down on the side, it's all right. And then some people will look at that and say, well, it hurts, there's damage, stuff's been done, you know what, I'm going to try to stand up as straight as I can, and I'm trying to be as useful a person as I can. I'm not going to give up. You got some people that uh, will uh, put others, uh, do all kinds of things to the body to take certain pains away, to make certain things happen. You know, I think there's a difference. When you've been hurt and you decide to, to make a stand and try to keep going, you push yourself, you ask God for help. You can look at this body as a, as a gift. It's when you start abusing that to take the place of God helping you through pain, through hurting, through troubles, that there's a problem. And I use this analogy real, real cautiously because we could go to tattoos and ear piercings and drinking and drugs and all that stuff. But how many of you have hurting and pain? You don't have to raise your hand. You have back aches, sore aches, arm aches, head aches, knee aches, toe aches. I, I abused my back so much when I was younger, uh, which I guess wasn't that long ago. But anyway, it, there, there's times that it's, you know, I break out in a sweat sometimes. I'm trying to stand up enough through the pain just to talk. And there's a number of things I could do to take that pain away. But I tell you what, some ideas that came through prayer and much, much intense prayer and asking God for help. 
has enabled me to be able to do things and not turn to certain things that would definitely destroy this temple. Now, this isn't a temple, or like some people would say, but it's what God gave me. It's my temple that God gave me. But I take it very seriously, and I, I take other people who go through this seriously because there is ways that you need help. And I, I mean, I take medicine too, so don't get me that I'm down in medicine tonight. But there's so many people out there that are, we're hurting and we'll use everything else to help us out. But I'm telling you, if you haven't turned to God for direction on how to take care of yourself, you're missing out on the first step. Again, first step in knowing him is to realize you're a sinner, ask forgiveness, start that relationship. But guess what? We ask God to help with all the spiritual and all this stuff. Guess what? He can help you with the physical as well. He can help you take care of this. No matter what you see in the mirror, you're, you're, you're God's creation. Don't abuse it. Get the help you need. We have great doctors and nurses and we got a pharmacist uh, that'll, that'll help you out and give you what you need. And it's good. We need to take advantage of that. But let God be the guide in that, guide you to the right people. Um, it's kind of a, I know it's probably not a way you wanted to look at that verse tonight, but I don't want you to look at these verses all with just the same kind of thing you do every time. Take, take some steps back and plug it into your life. Make it personal. God is speaking to you in this passage. We're not taking it out of context, but we are going to put it in the context of God speaking to you where you are. Not everybody deals with substance abuse and different things like that and other things. Uh, what we deal with is we, we miss out on that opportunity for God to lead us even in our physical pain. And that's a hard, that's a hard area for a, lot of, for a lot of people to deal with. Let's move on. So um, we're in 2 Corinthians. We may make it all the way through. I told you we could make it all the way through. We're going to try. Uh, so 2 Corinthians 3.16 says, Nevertheless, when one, of, when, when one turns to the Lord, the veil, the veil is taken away. It's pretty, pretty easy, right? The, the veil is taken away when you're brought to the Lord. So what does that mean? What are we doing here? Well, this is uh, talking about that relationship with God, it says, but their minds were blinded for until this day uh, the veil remains unlifted, the, the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil uh, is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. How many of you know somebody that's living under a bondage, whether it's through tradition, whether it's through a, a, a different belief and everything, and they're held in bondage in that position. This is kind of like this. The people were stuck in the Old Testament times, and they, they had this, it, it was a veil, but they're, and I'm trying to be quick about this, so forgive me for uh, skimming, but this is really the part where we need that veil removed. We don't need to, to live under, under that law. When Jesus was, died on the cross and he, he rose again, uh, the veil that was in the temple that divided us between God, the Holy of Holies, was torn apart. The veil of the Old Testament where uh, there needed to be a covering of the face, now through Jesus, we're able to experience through Jesus, God the Father, which was almost unheard of. They had to learn this. But there's other people not necessarily living in Old Testament times, but they're living in times today where there's a lie in front of them. They have it over their face, and it's hindering them from seeing the truth. And really the only true way, the only uh, uh, permanent way to make that veil removed is through Jesus Christ. Again, this is another portion of Scripture. You can go and help somebody uh, hurting in that area. Um, Let's uh, hurry right along, look at Galatians. Uh, Galatians 3.16, it 
It says, now Abraham, now, now to Abraham uh, and his seed uh, were in where the, where the promise was made. He does not, um, he does not say, uh, yeah, I'm trying to read too fast. And, and, do, and he, he does not say unto the seeds as many, uh, as of many, but as of one. And to, and to uh, your seed, who is Christ. So this is talking about all this change and things that can come up in your life. And again, jumping into one verse kind of doesn't do it justice all that well. And if you can read it properly, it probably would do it better. Uh, but we'll read this in context real quick. It says, Brother, and I speak in a manner of men. Uh, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, uh, no one annuls or adds to it. Now Abraham and his seed were the, uh, were the promise, uh, were promises made. And he does not say to the seeds as... Um, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And to this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, can, uh, cannot uh, annul the covenant which was confirmed before uh, by Christ, in Christ, that it should make uh, the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, uh, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Okay, I'm sorry my brain kind of got mixed up on that. I couldn't read it clearly for you. But this is not, not ch uh, changing, uh, not changing the subject, but this is saying where God has brought in a promise. And guess what? No matter what man says about the promise, no matter how old it was, if it was a promise, God's going to fulfill it. A lot of people don't have trust and faith in God because they, they're like, well, that was God of 2,000 years ago. Well, this is a promise being fulfilled even way after that. So guess what? There's proof through the scripture, one part right here, that God is still faithful. And he will still honor his promises and his covenants. And if you look at his people today, we can look through uh, the things that's happening right now and know that God is still honoring his covenant with his people this was a different matter, but still, God is one that will always honor what he says. Uh, Ephesians 3.16, uh, this is going, he says that he, that he would uh, grant you, according to his riches of glory, to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that is in you, and, and to be rooted and grounded in love. And may, and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes uh, all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Someone that doesn't understand how much God can love them, how much God can carry them, guess what? Start learning that measurement. Start learning how big that box is that God can fill with his love for you. You're going to find that the love of God surpasses everything. He says you can't even, hardly even comprehend it. People say, well, what's the measurement on that? Can't tell you. If you want to try to put it in a comparison with something, he tells us that we should love him more than our spouse. We should love him more than our kids. We should love him more than any other great possession we have. And guess what? He loves us more than that. That's hard to comprehend. But he says in his word that it's there. He also says in these passages right here that we can have a peace with God. He says we can have wisdom from God that is just amazing. We can have all kinds of rewards with our Lord if we trust in him. But if we keep that part closed, we'll never have it. Philippians 3.16, uh, it says, Nevertheless, to the, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us uh, all be of the same mind. We need this uh, unity to be together, to be able to, uh, as it says uh, above here, 
It says that I forget those things that are behind and I'm reaching forward to things that are ahead. And it says that we may uh, mature and that we may have a mind of God that, and God will reveal to us what we need to do together. He's given us a strength in numbers as a family. A family is always stronger together. It's not stronger apart, it's stronger together. And you can see here that he says, let us walk the same line, the same rule together. You can't separate it. You can't divide it. It needs to be that same mind. And that mind is Christ. And we come together and work with that together. Something wonderful that I feel that we can all uh, uh, can learn from. Again, uh, go to Colossians 3.16. And uh, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and monsting one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, this is a common reference. This is something that, you know, we need to let this word be in us, become alive in us, be able to teach us, be able to let us praise him, be able to, to, to bring a new life about us, not something that brings us down or sad. It's something that can really help us to worship God uh, in a way we never had before. But again, that's, that's getting in the word and letting it work in you. Now, if we continue on, uh, we'll know that we'll go to 1 Thessalonians. And if you look there, there's not, a, there's not really a, a 316 in that one. So we get to skim over that one. Um, if you look at the last, uh, at 316 in 2 Thessalonians, it tells us, it says, now... May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way, and the Lord will, will be with you all. This is a, uh, I, I like different salutations that Paul does to his people uh, when he tells them a, a goodbye or he kind of ends the letter. Uh, it's, and it talks about the Lord of peace. Uh, there's a lot of people that need that, that you can be taught something, something that is, that is great, something that is uh, a challenge to us, that is right here in this uh, short uh, uh, book here, but is that challenge, after it's given, it says, and you can have peace. Even all this stuff is challenging you. You, you know, don't be one that just sits there. It says, don't be one that just uh, gives in to stuff. He says, stand your ground, stand fast, and you can, you can be a great Christian, but let, let the peace of God come on you. You don't have to be stressed out. You don't have to be wore out by all this. Let God work in you and give you that strength that you need. Uh, again, uh, we go through 1 Timothy. We'll skip that and go to 2 Timothy. And 3.16 is all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for all good work. What good is the scripture? Well, it's good for equipping. It's good for readying you up. It's getting you going. This is something that really can take you forward in life. And not just, this can't be something, again, this can't be just something you get at church. It can't just be something you get for a time. This has to be something that you do uh, to make it profitable. It has to be something that is reoccurring in your life. Uh, you can get a nice size profitable thing in your life at one, one sitting. You know, people do win the lottery every now and then, but the odds of that are in the millions. So you want to take that chance or do you want to make your life profitable as can be, dig into the word. All right, so we go to the book of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And this is going back to the Old Testament about the, the um, Israelites in the wilderness. And the more you read, you read a lot of the New Testament, and it gives reference back to the, the wilderness uh, journey that they went through. I mean, there's a lot to be learned through that. There is so much that even today we can be, that we can learn from that. It says, now with, uh, verse 17, it says, now with whom uh, was he uh, angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom uh, did he swear that they would not enter 
uh, his rest, but but uh, to those who did, uh, but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter because of their what unbelief. Not because they didn't try hard enough. Not because they didn't work hard enough. Because they didn't believe. Not because they just did something wrong. They didn't believe. You imagine all those people, all the Israelite people that were saved out of the bondage of the, of the Egyptians were all freed, let go. They're going in the wilderness. For 40 years, God tried to teach them a lesson. And the only people that saw the promised man, land out of, that, out of that main group, there was two young boys that started that journey that became men, that became leaders. And they were the only ones out of that main group that got, that got to go in. Even their great leader, the only way he got to see it was from the top of a mountain. He got to look over and see it. Couldn't go in and enjoy it. Why? Because of unbelief. What will unbelief do? Well, it ruins Christmas for some. Okay, y'all needed that laugh. Never mind. All right. So it ruins Christmas for some, but unbelief in, in, a, in real life, in a Christian, in, in a life of people, will drive you away from Christ and you'll never have a relationship. And you'll be part of those that didn't believe, refused to believe, and one day that price will be paid. Let's hurry up and uh, go through the last few of these and we will be done. Don't mean to rush it too much, but uh, James 3, 16, and it says, for there were envy of self-seek uh, there were envy and self-seeking exists confusion and every evil thing and this is talking about uh, we when there's a lot of talk about uh, the evilness of the world and of and, and of people um, talking about what comes out of our mouth and what uh, what things we we lay on people sometimes when we're angry and upset things we normally wouldn't say or somebody that doesn't even know the Lord they can really let let things out that is just evil. Uh, there's words in here that, that go as strong as, as demonic things. You know, if we're unchecked by what is in our life, uh, there, can be, uh, uh, there can be some awful things that happen to us. Envy and self-seeking um, are, are the things that causes confusion. And usually that is followed by evil leading that on in our lives. We need to be careful uh, of these things. Uh, God warns us of that. Um, let's quickly go through uh, uh, Peter, uh, 1 Peter 3, uh, 16. It says, in having good conscience, um, let me try to read that, to, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if they, uh, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than to do an evil thing. There's a lot of pull in this world for us to do what is not right in the eyes of God. They would rather see us fall, rather see us do evil. There is a more of a draw for us to go the way of the flesh, as the Bible says. But even if people are out there uh, calling hypocrites calling us names calling us all these things said it is better to still stay in the good stay in what is right in the in in the way of the lord than this than and to suffer for a little bit it's good to suffer than it is to give in and do that evil that is before you something to think about you sit there and uh in the face of temptation uh keep those things in mind so you do not fall uh, 1 John 3.16, uh, it says, By this we know love because he laid his life down for us. Uh, again, kind of tying this, this is interesting how close it is to John 3.16, uh, but this is talking about how, how love is known because Jesus died for us. Again, man didn't kill him. Man didn't beat him to death on the cross, which they did beat him, and he was on the cross, but he gave his life for us. Now, lastly, the book of Revelation, chapter 3, 16, and we'll let you go. Uh, it says here, uh, it says, So then, because you are a lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you or vomit you 
out of my mouth. Interestingly, how we end this little study. It is kind of a very vivid notion, but it's someone that, or a church body, or a myriad of people that cannot be true to God, that go one way and the other way. They're blown around like the wind. God makes this plain and says, you are like a, a, a lukewarm substance that when you're put in the mouth to taste, to see how it is, it's just not good no matter what you do to it and you just want to vomit it. That is a, it is gross. It is kind of nasty. Y'all are making faces. I, I do it too. It's not, it's not something nice to think of. But that is how much we bother and upset our Lord when we don't take, take the things of him seriously. And that's why I wanted to take this with you tonight through this little study. I want you to take the word of God seriously. Some of you probably do. Some of you probably need some encouragement. Maybe you can uh, use this to help somebody else. We took a very quick step in the whole New Testament. A couple books we didn't have because it didn't have the 316 part in it. But you take this little bit, and you can do this with any familiar passage. Learn from those little things. And when you talk to people about the Word of God, or you yourself have a problem, you can open up the Word, and you can start somewhere and get familiar and be able to get something from the Word of God. Rather than doing a Google search, rather than turning to somebody on the TV and hoping that you got the right channel, listening to the, uh, a friend that may, may or may not give you good advice. Sometimes the advice you get from God is very straightforward and straight to the heart. Sometimes we as friends, we kind of like to sugar it up a little bit because we don't want to offend. Sometimes that's necessary to help, but sometimes we need that straight talk. The Word will always do that for you. And sometimes you need to let that be the voice for you speaking to somebody and the voice speaking to you. But unless we open it, this will never be more than just a book. We got to open it and glean from what's inside of it to be able to get this into our heart. As Psalm 119 says, that we hide God's word in our heart so we don't sin against him. The only way I know to do that, the only way I've been taught, is you got to open it and read it and get it in there. Let's pray.